Welcome back, everybody. Look, I'm doing another reaction video. It's been a while since I've done one of these, since producer Ryan, editor Ryan, camera guy Ryan, best boy Key Grip, audio engineer, videographer, all that Ryan. Uh, my baby bird spread his little wings, and he's moved out with his Penelope. So I had to wait until he got the studio set up at his new crib. So I am at Ryan's crib right now to review another fat electrician video and look y'all know i love nick this is an older one of his videos uh it's about 16 minutes we're gonna rip through take a look at this and see what y'all think let's take it away nick Ah yes, that time that communists tried to starve an entire city, so America and the UK teamed up to deliver 4.6 billion pounds of food and supplies to that city using nothing but cargo planes. <laughs> Today we're talking about the biggest economic and logistical flex of all time, America's Operation Vittles and the UK's Operation Plainfield coming together to be known as the Berlin Airlift. But first a word from our sponsor, this video is brought to you by Henson's Shaving. Okay, here's the deal. Henson's is a family owned machine shop that makes parts for the aerospace industry. There's literally parts on the Mars Rover that these guys made. And Ooh. one day they woke up and they're like, hey, we're just gonna make the most precise safety razor on the market. And this is it, this is all they sell. It comes in aluminum or titanium. If you wanna pay extra, it comes with a little stand and then they also sell the razor blades so you have a one-stop shop not because their razor blades are proprietary because this thing will take any shaving razor blade on the market you don't have to buy their proprietary cartridge you don't have to sign up for their monthly delivery thing no you buy this one time and then you can put any five cent razor in it and shave for the rest of your life so the product itself is fantastic but more importantly the company is awesome because every time a youtuber does an ad like this they get sent a little media packet full of talking points what to say what not to say and so on now i'm not supposed to discuss close this but the brief that I got for Henson's basically said there is no script do whatever you want we trust you also in the first paragraph they said this quote if for whatever reason you don't get a good shave with our product please let us know if we can't help you then don't endorse us we think we've made one of the very best razors in the world if you disagree we'd rather not ask you for a non-genuine endorsement so not only are the razors great that but this is the type lot. of company you want to support I'll have a link and a discount code down below let's get back to the video all right Okay, first off, before we get to the video, let me tell you, that safety razor is what my grandfathers used. And I remember as a kid, um, I wanted to play growing up. So my grandfathers would give me their old safety razors. Of course, they took the blades out, and I could put shaving cream on my face and rake that stuff off with a dull, no razor blade in the razor. And I thought I was cool. And dude... Uh, let me tell you something. Back in the day, Papa's face was always smooth and clean. So, hey, it makes sense to use that. You get you a stack. And they used to have slots. If you go into an old house and you bust into a wall, you're probably going to find in a bathroom wall, in between two studs, you're going to find all kind of old rusted out razor blades because they used to put a slot in there. When you changed your blade out, you put the blade in the slot and it was just going and filling in that wall. A little trivia for y'all. How's some of that? Important background info, after World War II, the Allied forces took control of Germany and it was split into pretty much four different chunks. The Soviets got a piece, America got a piece, the French and the British both got a piece. Here's a map of that right here. Okay, here's where it gets a little weird. Berlin was also split into four equal chunks. The problem with that was Berlin was 100 miles into the Soviet territory. So you have this little tiny speck on the map of British, French and American territory completely surrounded by the USSR. While that is weird, it wasn't really a problem because right after World War II, everybody was still an ally. So America, the British and the French had no problems using the roadways and the trains to get food and supplies to their section of Berlin. Now, just so we're on the same page, Berlin and essentially all of Germany to a slightly lesser extent is essentially a third world country at this point in time. Yeah. Berlin in particular has essentially been turned into rubble from allied bombings. The entire German economy is in the toilet and all of the German people are not getting a lot of sympathy from the global community because well, they kind of started it. Now, with the Allied forces in control of Germany, it is their job and their responsibility to help take care of the German people. Now, the Western powers, America, Great Britain, and France, they're all on the same page. They all have the same game plan. 
They want to go in, render aid in the short term to the German people, then in the long term, help prop up their economy, get them back on their own feet, and then they can leave. The USSR, on the other hand, aka the communists, absolutely hate that idea. The last thing a bunch of communists want is people being able to take care of themselves, so they step in and they're like, no, absolutely not. We're going to build a communist utopia out of this place. So in order to stop the Western powers from helping Germany, they decide that they're going to print billions and billions of Reichsmarks, the German currency. They devalue the currency so there's so much money that it's no longer a store of value to the point that it literally takes a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread. Because of this, the already struggling German economy completely collapses and a black market sets in and the new currency for Germany is essentially cigarettes and food. And this goes on for like two years with the West trying to negotiate with the USSR on how to proceed. And during that time, the people of Berlin are quite literally starving and freezing to death with the average Berliner eating less than a thousand calories a day. Eventually- Star the West out. steps in and they're like, fuck it, we're just going to do it without the communists because we have to help these people. So they create a new type of currency for Germany known as the Deutschmark, and it's going to be seen as a real store of value and help rebuild the German economy. The Soviets find out about this and they freak out, basically break all diplomatic communication with the Western powers, and they officially want to break up and just have East versus West, capitalism versus communism, Hungary versus Fed. This is where the Cold War really starts kicking off. And the first ideological battleground of the Cold War is going to be Berlin, because remember, it's 100 miles into Soviet territory, and a big chunk of it is still controlled by the Western powers. So the Soviets decide they need to take over that part of Berlin too. They can't have a little speck of capital in their communist utopia. Now, luckily for the communists, it's an easy fix. They really don't have to do anything because the minute the West Berliners see what a communist utopia really looks like, they're gonna willfully and freely denounce capitalism and run over and become communist too, right? Wrong, no. that's never gonna happen because <laughs> communism sucks. It's always sucked and it's always going to suck. So the communists are gonna do what they always do. They are going to basically present West Berlin the option join or we will attempt to kill you because if you don't know that's the dirty little secret to communism they always talk about seizing the means of production what they never bother to tell you is that people are also part of that means of production and they will seize you too so that's exactly what they do they attempt to seize west berlin they blockade it off from the western powers they cut off every road every railway and every waterway so that the <coughs> western powers cannot get west berlin food, or any other supplies. And then they cut off the power to that section of the city, quite literally freezing and starving them to death until they comply. So obviously this is a diplomatic and humanitarian disaster. All the military leadership runs over to President Truman and they're like, hey, what do you want us to do? Basically, we got three options. Option A, we can start rolling tanks in and kick off World War III right now. Option B, we can just leave the Berlin people there to die. And option C, we can try to fly in as much food and supplies as possible but getting enough to feed an entire city is basically going to be impossible. What do you want to do? Now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Truman basically said, we're America. We don't start world wars. We just finish them. Also, and I quote, we stay in Berlin, period, which narrows it down to one single option. They are going to fly in enough food and enough supplies to try to feed all of West Berlin. Here's the catch with that. The American leadership has absolutely no idea what that's going to take or how to even proceed. So they go to the British government who has just spent the last decade rationing their own people and they have a great understanding of what it takes to keep a large population of people fed and warm. So Great mm. Britain crunches the numbers and they figure to get every single person in West Berlin 1,700 calories a day, it's going to be 1,500 tons of food every single day. In wow. addition to that, since the power got cut off, they're going to need 2,500 tons of coal and fuel every single day. Okay, 4,000 tons, just so we're all on the same page, that is 8 million pounds of supplies wow. every single day just to keep everyone alive. And the best cargo plane they have to work with at this point in time is the C-47 Skytrain, which has a maximum capacity of three tons, meaning that they are gonna have to land 1,333 cargo planes into Berlin every single day. To put that into perspective, there's only 1,440 minutes in a day, meaning that one plane has to land every minute and eight seconds. This is impossible. Despite that, the newly formed United States Air Force says, hold my nuclear bombs and watch this shit, because on June 26, 1948, two days after the Soviet blockade, they launch Operation Vittles, where they are going to try to feed an entire city via cargo plane. Two days after that, June 28th, the UK says, hey, we're going to help too, and the RAF launches Operation Plane Fair, and together, this becomes known as the Berlin Airlift, 
and right out of the gate, it is a complete and utter shit show. They're trying to fly in planes from absolutely everywhere. It is disorganized chaos. There's planes crashing. There's mid-air collisions. It's a complete disaster. And on their best day, they're maybe able to get a thousand tons of supplies, less than a fifth of what they need. Now, at this point, the conditions in Berlin are getting worse and worse by the day. The communists are essentially laughing at the stupid capitalist pigs, at which point America calls up one of its main characters, a man by the name of General William Tunner. All right, this is a guy that coordinated all the logistics of getting supplies into China during World War II when they had to fly over the Himalayas. If anybody can unfuck this situation, it's going to be him. And that's exactly what he does. So General Tunner comes in and he's like, here's the deal. We're going to fly these planes like we're conducting an orchestra. There's three air channels to Berlin. The two on the outside are going to be planes going to Berlin. And the one in the middle is going to be planes leaving Berlin. For the two air channels going into Berlin, we're going to launch one plane every three three minutes all day every single day and those planes are going to fly at five separate altitudes staggering every single time to give them just enough time to land the germans on the receiving end of this are like we're literally starving to death we got to help out the americans and the british with this so they show up and they start unloading the cargo planes for them and they get so good at unloading these planes that they can unload all three tons of cargo in under seven minutes and help get the planes turned around and sent back out and this turns into one of the most beautiful humanitarian team effort moments in human history. There's American and British pilots, air crew members, mechanics, all just showing up in West Germany without even being called to help with this effort and to fly wow. and repair these planes to keep them going around the clock. And then over in Berlin, the same thing is happening. There's Luftwaffe airplane mechanics showing up to help repair the American and British cargo planes to keep everything running. The two sides that were fighting against each other just a few years ago are now working together to save people. Everybody involved in this operation gets so good at what they're doing that the choke point that's holding up even more progress is that they don't have enough airfields to land the planes on. So the Germans straight up build another one. The only problem with that was there was this big ass apartment building in the way. And when the pilots lowered their landing gear, their landing gear would only clear that apartment roof by like 20 feet, which seems like it would be kind of terrifying so the germans are like hey you want us to rip that apartment building down what do you guys want us to do and the american and raf pilots are like bro we just got done flying in world war ii with you guys and the japanese shooting at us <laughs> the apartment's gonna be fine trust me and sure enough they start not only hitting but exceeding the quota of 4500 tons a day and this infuriates the soviets this is the biggest economic and logistical flex wow. of all time it shouldn't even be possible and yet america the uk and the people of west berlin are somehow pulling it off at this point the soviets decide they have to try to do something to stop this so they start sending up all their fighter planes to try to mess with all the american and british cargo pilots by flying too close they're basically trying to mess up air traffic yeah, get cause them, accidents get them off their do track. anything they can to slow down this logistical not miracle. shoot at them however it doesn't get really them off work their... why because the american and british pilots know that it's basically a bluff because it's essentially a giant game of fuck around and find out because <laughs> if the soviets actually do anything it's going to kick off world yeah. war III and at this point in time america is the only country on the planet that has nuclear bombs and a president that's not afraid to use them okay if you're not picking up what i'm putting down i'm trying to tell you that the american and raf pilots are flying with the confidence of knowing that if one of these soviets shoots them down president truman is going to bitch slap their entire country with the sun needless to say they were unfazed by the soviet harassment how unfazed were they thank you so much for asking cue our <laughs> next main character gail halverson and AKA the candy bomber. He was one of the mini pilots that was flying supplies into Berlin and somewhere along the way he decided that he was going to start dropping candy bars with little handkerchief parachutes out of the window of his plane over West Berlin so that the kids could get some candy and eventually this caught on and all the kids were waiting where the planes would fly over hoping that they would get a candy bar then the American government caught on and they're like oh shit this is a great propaganda opportunity imagine what it would be like if every single plane was dropping candy out of it so that's exactly what they do they start dropping a bunch of candy 
candy out of every plane and then they make propaganda out of it. But then it gets bigger because all the American candy companies start sponsoring it and donating even more candy to drop. And then it gets bigger because all the kids in America and the UK start raising money at school to buy candy to give to the kids of Germany and they're giving out even more candy. And the Soviets have to stand there and watch as the Americans and the British are not only flying in a literal Costco worth of shit into West Berlin every <laughs> single day, but they're dropping candy out of their planes like it's a fucking parade the entire time. And this is all going on while East Germany and East Berlin is eating potatoes it. and standing in bread lines, and it makes the Soviets look like the biggest assholes on the planet. Because not only are the people of East Germany watching the Western world essentially move heaven and earth to help out West Berlin, they're also watching the Soviets be more interested in disrupting America and the UK from helping people than they are in helping the people of East Germany. In short, America and the UK are playing to win and the Soviets are playing to not lose and it is leading to a lower quality of life for all of East Germany. As it turns out, Sun Tzu was yet again correct when he said the sun may rise in the east, but it sets in the west, and that's because west side is the best side. But that's not <laughs> what it means. Really? Not even close. That might have been Ice Cube, actually. West Bank's the best bank. Anyways, so now in retaliation for all That's this, what they America, say down. the UK, and pretty much the entire you know, Western world are going to have a bunch of embargoes well, on the Soviet Union and Algiers. punish them financially and economically. Now, the Soviets absolutely cannot afford this, but they keep telling themselves, it's okay, winter is coming, and as soon as winter gets here, they're not going to be able to land all these planes, and this whole thing's going to fall apart. We just have to wait <clears> out long enough for winter to slow down America and the UK. So that's what they do. They just try to shoulder the financial burden and wait for winter to come and put a stop to this entire thing. Winter comes and winter, it does slow down some of the flights, but here's the catch. America was also developing bigger, better cargo planes. And now America isn't just flying the C-47, America's flying their new cargo plane, the C-74 Globemaster. And as opposed to the previous C-47 carrying only three tons, the Globemaster can carry 25. So despite the fact that weather can sometimes delay flights, America and the UK continue to improve and increase the amount of supplies that they are delivering daily. And by Easter Sunday, 1949, they would break their own record, landing 1,383 planes in a single day, delivering 13,000 tons of supplies, which is 26 million pounds, which obviously is like 11.8 million kilograms or roughly 87 blue whales. <laughs> yeah, the United States Air Force and the RAF shipped 87 blue whales worth of crap into West Berlin in a single day. And because of this, it becomes very apparent to the Soviet Union that America can and will keep this shit up forever if they have to. And they are finally forced to give up the blockade because they cannot shoulder the financial burden anymore. And that would come down on May 12th, 1949. And with the roads and railways to West Berlin finally open once again, the Berlin airlift would come to an end after 15 months 277,000 flights spanning 92,000 miles and delivering 2.3 million tons of aid which is roughly 4.6 billion pounds or 15,333.333333333 blue whales. This is the greatest logistical and humanitarian feat ever accomplished and the Western world did it with communism doing everything it could to slow it down. So in conclusion, fuck communism. The best way to support the channel is go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. The and then bus. the Soviet Union got all pissy and built a wall through the middle of Germany. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. <laughs> all right. So look, I've, I've always said this. Uh, this young man, Nick, he is a great. He, he is an entertaining, captivating history teacher. He may not be teaching uh, right now. He's working on getting his master's degree so he can teach. But this guy presents stuff in such a way that I, I've said it in previous videos where I'm reviewing Nick. If, if I'd have had him as a history teacher, I'd have made a lot better grades in history because he's finding the facts and he's still teaching me stuff to this day. 
how many of y'all knew all that took place to get to be able to rail and drive in the supplies into Berlin? I didn't before I watched this video. Um, I mean, great job, Nick. Always enjoy watching your stuff. Producer Ryan's going to have a link to your channel to make sure that uh, everybody goes back and watches the original content. If y'all stayed here this long, I appreciate that. Go ahead and mash that like button. Help me out there. You don't know the algorithm. If people are liking the video, guess what? That tells the algorithm. Keep showing it. If you haven't subscribed, please give me a sub. Check out some of my other stuff. I do cooking stuff. I do natural resource stuff. Um, yeah, it's a grab bag of redneckology. So hope to see y'all again. Y'all take care and thanks so much.